Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God, hallelujah. Good night, good night, Facebook, good night, YouTube. We just want to thank you. Welcome again. Yet another Thursday, God has kept us going. And for that, we're so extremely grateful. So welcome to the kingdom mandate of Jesus Christ ministry, the house where God dwells, the house where God is always answering our prayers. And we want to thank you for making it to the weekly Thursday night session. It starts at around 7, 7 50 live um, UK time. So wherever you are from in the world, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, welcome. We just want to thank you for keep joining. And don't forget to tell a friend, tell family members about the page so that they too can also receive a word from God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 I must have the Savior with me for a day. Not walk alone. I must be his presence near me and his arms around me from then my soul shall fear no ill let him lead me where he will i will go without a murmur and his footsteps follow still. I said I must have the Savior with me, for I did not walk alone. I must be his presence near me, and his arms around me throng. When my soul shall fear no ill, let him lead me where he will. I will go without a murmur, and his footsteps follow still. Sometimes we need to let the songs minister to us. The song says, I must have the Savior with me, for I dare not walk alone. In this season, we need to ensure that we're not walking alone. We can walk a lonely road, but we need to ensure that the Savior is with us when we're walking that lonely road. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So once again, thank you for coming. Thank you, everyone that's on the Zoom for coming. God bless you, everyone on the Zoom and those on Facebook and YouTube. God bless you all. I promise I won't keep you very long tonight, but you shall, if you open your spirit, open your mind, receive a word from God. Hallelujah. So tonight our topic will, our topic is, what is your revelatory experience? What is your revelatory experience? experience and the scripture reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 40 and verses 31. For they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I know this is a perfect, perfect um, scripture that a lot of um, pastors minister on and they might use it to tell, to, to encourage um, believers or encourage anyone that may be going through certain um, situations in life, certain trials in life, that uh, they need to wait upon God, that they need to trust the process. And I remember when I did the, last week when I did, if you remember last week, when I did that topic and I gave an example using my mom that she would read the Bible, but sometimes she don't 
get not sometimes you don't get the revelatory experience so when i came off um the live and she called me and she was like if i was beside you i would twist your mouth what do you mean i don't get the revelatory experience and we just laughed about it we just joked about it and then i i remember giving her a scripture and i said give me the revelation for the scripture but she just quoted back the scripture to me using but the same words and i said to her mom you just plagiarized the scripture if you wrote an essay and you use the same words they would tell you that you plagiarized because you didn't put it in your words in your own words you didn't be critical you weren't analytical so i said i realized that sometimes as believers we may not get a, a deeper understanding of what the scripture is actually trying to say to us and even though I might get this revelation from the scripture, somebody else will use the same scripture and may get another revelation. But it doesn't mean either way it is wrong. It's what you reveal from that scripture. It's what God ministers to you pertaining that scripture that's important. So they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. When we read the Bible, and we read, um, we read the Bible and as pertaining to the scripture. There are two animals that God compares himself to, and that's the eagle and the lion. So when you go throughout the Bible, there's two, two animals that God tends to compare himself to, and that's the eagle and the lion. Now, when you look at both animals, we will notice that they have one thing in common. And that is that they are both leaders. So the main characteristics of both animals, the eagle and the lion, is that they are both leaders. The eagle is the leader of the air and the lion is the leader of the jungle. Now you might be saying, what does this scripture have to, what, what I'm saying has to do with the scripture that I'm reading. But if you stay still, open up your hearts, open your minds, open up your ears and receive, it will all make sense in a minute to you. Now, as you read the Bible, you will notice that God identifies himself with both animals, as I said before. And when you read Revelation 5, it says, I am the lion from the tribe of Judah. And remember, Judah means praise. And in Deuteronomy 32, it talks about how God spreads his wings over his people, sheltering them under his protection. But for the purpose, purpose of this message tonight, we will solely be focusing on the eagle as re in reference to the scripture, the chapter that we just read, the verse that we just read. So let us, let's take the eagle. The eagle is silent. It doesn't talk a lot like the parrot. You know, growing up, you used to, growing up, you used to hear our parents say, um, you talk too much, you talk too much, are you a parrot? But it's not until I get older, I comprehend what, you know, my mom would say or what parents would say to the children when they say, you talk too much, are you a parrot? But the eagle is not like the parrot. They are very silent. They don't talk. They don't um, run their mouth like the parrot. But not the eagle. They, 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 their mentality is to aim for the sky, not to talk. They don't want to go around talking, talking, talking. They just want to aim for the skies. The thing with eagle as well is they fly with other eagles. You will never see eagle flying with any other birds. The eagle flies only with eagles. They don't mix with other birds. And it made me want, it brought back to my memory growing up in the Caribbean. And you hear a majority of parents will say to the children, show me your company and I will show you who you are. And it's a perception that it tries to indicate if you if you if you associate with um gang members then you are a part of that gang and if you associate yourself with um um thieves then you are associated as a thief and if you associate yourself with um intellectual people you will become intellectual 
So growing up, you always hear parents will tell children, show me your friends and I will show you who you are. It don't have to mean that you will turn out if they're bad or good, but it's, it's kind of a way to kind of steer you to say, it can be, if you're associated with intellectual, it can be that you will become intellectual if you stay focused with like-minded people. And that, that's the, what it used to mean to us. And that's what you find now that's happening within the body of Christ is that persons are formulating little little cliques and they're formulating little little sub subdivisions within the body of Christ. And because eagles only score with eagles, they're like-minded. So when persons will try to formulate different cliques within the body of Christ, they may not be on the same level. They may not have the same like-mindedness. And as a result of that, you will start to get all these confusions that is happening within the body of Christ because they're not like-mindedness. They're not hoping to achieve the same desired outcome. They're not trying to ascertain the same goal, but everybody thinks that they're so much anointed that they will formulate these uh, cliques and they will pull this one here. And, and because people don't have discerning of spirit to discern these things that are not in the will of God, what you find happening is that confusion comes in. Um, the devil finds way to enter in and then you, you end up fighting unnecessary battles. But the eagle, as I said, only flies with other eagles, which means that they're on the same page. They have the same desired outcome and they will have each other's back. And it's something that you will find is not happening in the body of Christ. People are not having each other's back within the body of Christ. Persons are fighting against the ministers. Persons are fighting against the congregants. Persons are fighting against visitors and it's something that needs to be addressed within the body of Christ and it's something that needs to be stopped. The eagle has the best vision and can focus on their prey as far as five kilometers. They can see four or five times further than the average person. So we as humans, they will say we have 20-20 vision. But the eagle can see as far away as five kilometers. And they can see four or five times more than the average person. So if we have 20-20 vision and they can see four or five times better than us with 20-20 vision, it's an indication that, that, that they, they have excellent vision. They have excellent eyesight. The eagle can spot the prey and they will never move their focus from that prey they, until they grab it. So what the eagle does, because they have excellent vision and they can see up to five kilometers away, once they spot their prey, they latch on to that prey and they will not take the eyes of the prey and they're soaring to get that prey. And that's why Proverbs 21 tells us, where there is no vision, the people perish. So as Christians, God is telling us that when we have a vision, we need to ensure that we stay locked on to that vision, like the eagle latches on to its vision and he doesn't take his eyes off the vision of the prey until he catches the prey. So God never tells us that we won't have obstacles and challenges. But what God is saying to us is that when trials comes, when obstacles come, when temptation comes, you don't take your eyes off the vision that don't take your eyes off the goal. Don't take your eyes off the purpose that is about to be fulfilled in your life. But if you stay focused, if you stay rooted and grounded and keep your eyes on the prize, keep your eyes on the target, don't get distracted with all the gossiping, with all the backbiting, with all the murmuring, but keep your eyes, your mind focused on what you are about to achieve. Keep your minds and your eyes 
stay steadfast on what God, you know, sometimes a prophet will give you a word. And somebody will come to you and they will say something negative. And it takes your eyes off what God is trying to ascertain. Sometimes God will talk to you himself directly and he will tell you something. But because sometimes as humans, we talk so much and we say it to the wrong person, it takes your mind off the vision. And that's why you find the ego will not talk. The ego just stays focused on the prey that he, he or she is trying to catch and they aim for the prey. They don't let no one distract them. They don't let anyone, anyone say, they don't let another ego tell them anything. And because they're like-minded, they all have the same desired goal. So they don't get distracted. So whenever another ego sees another ego going after their prey, they don't distract them. They don't cause anything to stop them from losing sight of the prey that they're about to catch. And that's why we need to have the mentality of an ego so that nobody distracts us. Nobody takes our mind of where God is trying to take you in this season. You know, there's, you know, something that separates the ego from other birds that I found so fascinating is the love for storm. The eagles love the storm. When the storm clouds gather in the sky, you know, when the storm is about to gather and the, the cloud gets black and the place gets dark. And we all know as, 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 as humans, we hate it when it gets like that because we know rain is gonna come. We know for those who live in the Caribbean and, 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 and other places that get storm, we know that it's not a nice experience for us because the thunder, the lightning and all the heavy rains, but not the ego. The ego actually loves the storm. When it, when it begins to darken and every, well, notice how all the birds, begin to, to take cover in the trees and on branches. So whenever it starts to get dark, you notice you don't see any, any, any birds around. They go and they take cover, they take refuge, they hide from the storm. All the other birds will hide from the storms, but not the eagle. The eagle gets excited. They get excited about the storm and they use the wind from the storm to lift themselves higher. And as they get higher above the storms, they use the wind to glide themselves and they rest their wings. So when the storm is about to come and the eagle is getting excited, they go above the clouds. And you know when it's winding, they use the wind from the storm to glide them through and then they rest the wings and the wind just takes them. So a storm to birds, other birds, is not a happy time for them. And it's just like us as humans. The storms in our life is not a happy time for us. It's not a time that we like, it's not something that we like to experience. But if you just relax, God will glide you through the storm. As I said, the eagle loves the storm. They get excited about the storm. They don't fly away and hide, but they use the storm to their advantage. God never tells us that we are not going to have storms in our life. He never tells us that um, the Christian walk would be easy. But what God did tell us is that when we start to experience storms in our life, and as humans, our storms comes in the form of financial hardship. It comes in the form of um the loss of a loved one, it comes in the form that we can't pay our bills, our house is being repossessed, it comes with people rejecting us, but God never tells us that we won't have storms, but what he started to tell us is that everything is going to be okay, and when we feel like everything is against us, that we should remember that he is there. The songwriter said, one set of footprints in the sand. Oh Lord, why at the time when I needed you the most, you would leave me. And the Lord replied, my precious, precious child, I love you. I will never ever leave you. When you saw one set of footprints in the sand, it was then that I was carrying you. So what God is saying, you have to at some point 
in your Christian walk, have to. It is a must that you're going to go through the storm. But you need to stay steadfast. You need to stay rooted and grounded. We should remember to stand on the word of God. Because as he said in Hebrews 13 verse 5, he will never leave us nor would he forsake us and as he tells us in second corinthians 4 we are troubled on every side yet not distressed we are perplexed but not in despair persecuted but not forsaken cast out but not destroyed so at some point in our life we're going to get distressed we're going to get perplexed. We're going to get persecuted. We're going to be forsaken. The loved one's going to forsake you. A man's going to forsake you. A woman's going to forsake you. Children sometimes forsake parents. Parents sometimes forsake children. But what God says, we will be cast down, but we will never be destroyed. And in order for us not to be destroyed, we need to ensure that we're we're enduring the storms and maintaining within that wind and let the wind glide us through. We need to remember when we're faced with situations in our life and we feel like we cannot make it and we feel like giving up and you feel like all hope is gone. Just keep telling yourself that you can make it and you can make it through the storm. If you just allow God to catapult you, he will take you above the clouds and let you glide through the storms in your life. Hallelujah, glory, 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 hallelujah. What we need to remember in order for God to help us through the storm, you need to ensure that you are following the biblical principles he has set out for us. So there's no point thinking we're going to go through storms, but we're living in sin. It just makes the storm 10 times worse. You know, when the um, meter, the main office issue a storm, they go from, um, they say it's a yellow alert or a red alert, and you know, a red alert means danger, danger. So whenever we're in sin, it just means you're now in a red alert. It's not that God will leave you, but it just means that you're going to go through a longer trial period than necessary because you cannot be in sin and expect God to continue to walla walla in the mess because the Bible says he's not the author of confusion and he's not the son of man to lie. So you're going to go through the storm and he will be there for you if you just follow the biblical principle and endure to the end. And Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not on your own understanding and in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct you. He shall direct you through the storm. He will direct you through the head of the heartache. He'll direct you through the turmoil when the kids are giving trouble and they're going and you think that they're not following the rules and you think that they're going down the wrong route and they're following the wrong set of um, the following the wrong crowd, but what God is saying if we keep praying and we endure the storm and if we continue to trust Him, He will give you the tools required, the tools needed to take you through the storm. You will find rest in the eye of the storm as He glides you along. Don't give up, don't give up on the storm, don't give up when the storm comes. Don't get disheartened. Don't get dismayed. But just let God glide you through the storm. You see, I read the scriptures. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as an eagle. What this is saying to us is not just to say to ourselves, or to say to someone, teach me how to wait, Lord. Or to let God teach us teach us how to wait. It's yes, we need God to teach us how to wait. But it's a deeper under, there's a deeper level that this scripture is trying to show us that will encourage us, that will motivate us for when the storm comes. Because when storm comes, we don't understand what is going, what we're going through. 
We don't understand. And that's why, you know, we, we used to, growing up, I used to hear my mom say, oh dear, Lord, don't let go of my hand. Because whenever there's a storm, it, 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 we want to give up. We get frustrated. We get fatigued. And there's sometimes, you know, arguing. Sometimes you'll be having a period where everything just seems to be going up and up and up. And then you stop and say, I haven't had any bad experience lately. I haven't had any bad thing happen. And it's like sometimes we're anticipating that something bad is going to happen. And maybe God is saying, no, it's not the time for something bad. Enjoy the good times. Because when storm comes, you're going to have to remember the good times and that God was there. And I will stay faithful now that the storm has arrived. So even though the scripture said, teach me, Lord, how to wait, it's not always a um, thing to teach me, Lord, but how do you wait? How are you going to wait? How are you going to endure the storm? What the scripture is teaching us is at some point when we get there, we're going to need to have an ego-like mentality. There's something when I, when, when I read the scripture, I said, and I draw for the encyclopedia because I wanted to know what the, the, the revelatory um, experiences that the scripture is telling me. And it says the average lifespan of an eagle is 70 years. So the average life that an eagle lives is up to 70 years. They have the longest lifespan, lifespan among all the birds. However, in order for the eagle to reach that age, they have to make some tough decisions. They have to make a decision, and I'm going, am I going to die or am I going to live? And the ones that choose to die will die around 40 years of age. So the eagles that, will, that go through the tough decision will, will live up to around 70 years of age. But the eagles who choose not to go through that, to do that, 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 that son, who choose not to make this decision, will die around the age of 40 years. And the ones that choose will go on to live. They have to go through. And this is what the eagle, the ones that go through the age, that live up to the age of 70, they have to go through a process known as the molting process. So the eagles that live up to the age of 70, they have to go through a process known as the molting process. Stay with me now. I will, it will make sense in a little while. Just stay with me. Don't, don't, don't go, don't go. Stay. It's going to make sense in a little while. You see, there, you see, by the time the eagle reaches in its 40s, they have long beaks. And they have the they have long beaks and the talons. So by the time the eagle reaches its 40s, its long flexible beak, flexible, its long flexible talons or the claws. So the claws that they use to catch the prey, it becomes long and it bends and they can no longer grab the prey. They, not, they can no longer get food to eat because the prey, the, the, the claws, they call it talons, which I'm trying to make you know what the talon is, is the claws. The claws become bent so they can't grasp the, the prey when they go out. And if they can't grasp and catch the prey, it means that they cannot eat. So, the beak now is long and sharp beak also becomes bent. Their vision starts to blur. So the molting process of the eagle, it starts off with the long bendy claws, long beak, the vision starts to get blurry. It's the feathers become extreme, extremely thick. The, the feathers become thick, it's aged, it's worn out, and it, it is heavy. And as a result, the feathers begin to get to start to stick on the on its chest. The feathers start to stick on the chest, and when the feathers start to stick, it makes it difficult for them to fly. And because the eagle, the feathers are aged and it's worn out, 
You know, when you buy a shoe and you wear the shoe so often, the shoe become worn out. The shoe can't take no more. And some person, they may love the shoe so much that they will take the shoes and they will they will take it to the, the, the shoe shop. Oh, I've got the name. The, the, the shoe smith, and they will they will they will put on a new bottom money because they love the shoes so much. Or the heels, and they will tip the heels because they want to keep the shoes. So the ego, the, the, the feathers are so aged, it's so old that they can't use the feathers to fly at high altitude. And this is where the ego has to make that very important decision of his life to die or to go through a very painful process of change. And for those ego who choose this to go through that painful process of change, they will fly to a mountain top and it sits on its nest. The ego then proceeds to knock its beak against a rock until it plucks out. So to go through the molting process, the start of the molting process for the ego is that they have to fly to the top of a mountain and they have to sit in a nest and they have to hit the beak on that rock until that beak comes out. So imagine how painful it is. The other day I hit my toe on the, on the frame of the bed and it was so painful. So imagine an ego hitting the beak on that rock is very, very painful. After he plucks out the beak, he has to now wait for the beak to grow back. So after he plucks out the beak, he has to stay on the top of that mountain and he has to, 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 to wait for the beak to grow back. And when the beak goes back, the beak grows back, he then begins to pluck out his talons. He begins to pluck out his claws, the claws that he used to catch the prey. And after the talon grows back, so after the claws grow back, it's now time for the eagle to start plucking out the old, tired, thick, worn out, heavy feathers. So the process starts off with the beak, then the claws, then its feathers. And he has to wait for the beak to grow back before he can pluck out the claws. And then when the claws grow back, he starts to pluck out the feather. After that, the eagle now has to wait for new feathers to grow back. This whole process, takes up to 150 days or five months. But what we need to understand, not all eagles make it through the molting period. Not all eagles who make that tough decision make it through the molting period. Because remember, they're not able to catch their prey. Because if you are in a wilderness and they're in a mountain for five months, unable to hunt food, they're not eating for that five months. And something notable about the eagle, they don't eat cell food, they don't eat cell blood, they only eat meat that is fresh. So because if they can't reserve like how the ants will reserve in the summertime, you see the ants. And in the wintertime, you don't see the ants because the ants reserve the food for when winter comes. The eagle cannot reserve food during the molting process. So it's like they're going for five months of fasting. They're going through five months of no food, nothing. And that's why some eagles don't make it. But for those eagles who make it through that molting process, for those who manage to endure the pain, the suffering, they are rebirthed, they are transformed. And what you see happen, they begin to rise again, stronger than they were before. They are rejuvenated, their youth is restored, and they are now able to soar to higher heights than before. Their visions are restored. 
oh Lord God Almighty, the visions are not restored. Before the vision was blurred, but now the vision after the molting season, the vision begins to become four or five times more than the humans. You see, as Christians, we go through our molting season, and this is where we have to fast. The eagle cannot eat food for five months, yet still God says he give us power dominancy over the, the birds of the air over the animals on earth and an eagle can go five months without food and some of us can't go one day without food some of us can't go half a day without food we say fast every thursday but persons don't want to fast we said you need to fast to draw closer to God and persons don't want to fast. And then you see somebody with the anointed that will sit down there and go through the seven days fasting, that goes through the 10 days fasting, that goes through the 21 day fasting. And you will see your, your Christian brother or sister that, that, that go through the fasting period and have their anointing and God pour out the anointing upon them and God pour out certain giftings of the Holy Spirit upon them. And you want to be envious of them. You want to be covetous of them. And you don't want to go through that same process that they went through for God to bless them with that level of anointing, for God to bless them with that gift that they have. Some of us say some persons want the gift of prophecy, but God can't trust you with the gift of prophecy because if not fasting, you're not praying. And some of us have mouth that is so light. Our tongue is so light. Our tongue has no backbone. We don't know how to talk to persons in the body of Christ. We don't know how to intercede for people. We don't know how to be humble in the body of Christ. We don't let our behavior reflecting home on the street. And some of us, we sit down in, 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 in our home and we use the most profane languages. And then you come to church and you want to sit down and ask us holy and sanctimonious, but God is watching. God is not confused. God is not the author of confusion. You can't sit down and think that you're going to be envious of another person's anointing, and you think that you carry the same anointing, you're fooling yourself. So the ego has to go through that molten, painful process. And some of us as Christians cannot even go through with no money in the bank account, no food in the kitchen, can't pay the electric bill, can't pay the rent, can't pay the light. We start to get disheartened. We want to give up when the, when, when, when the storm comes in our life. And then you want to compare yourself and say you have an evil mindset. No, 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 no. Some of us need to stop being a parrot and start being an ego. When you look at the Bible, there are several individuals in the Bible that went through their molting season, not because God was punishing them. Sometimes we see persons going through some situations in their life, and we start to make assumptions. You hear that a person is sick, and you start to make assumptions that what did that person do? They must not be living from God. They must do something wrong. You hear that a person have an operation. You hear that a person got evicted. You hear that a person um, is really, really, really doing bad in their life. And they're going through a really nasty time. And you start to assume that God is punishing them. You start to assume that they, carry, they don't carry the mantle of God. You start to assume, and then you start to take, 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 take gossiping and start gossip the person. May some of your tongue catch a fire when you start to gossip about the people within, within the body of Christ. May some of your tongue fall out when you start to put down people that is going through the situation. Instead of praying them up, instead of praying for them, instead of interceding for them, you want to continue to run your mouth, gossiping to, 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 to John Doe, Jane Doe, he, she, and the old fat lady, when you don't know anything that God is doing in that person's life. 
As I said, there were several individuals in the Bible that went through the molting process. But God wasn't punishing them. But so that they can, but what God was doing is that so that they can be a testimony for persons who may be experiencing trials, trials or painful situation to show us, to enlighten us that we will face adversaries, we will face persecution, we will face drought, we will face financial hardship. And these individuals go through the, 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 the molting season, they go through the painful season, and it is what we can use as Christians to help us to help encourage us whilst we walk within the body of Christ. It's not that God was punishing them, but we use them as testimonies to say, okay, this one went through that in the Bible and they trusted God and God continued to bless them. God continued to give them double portion anointing. So when you see an individual within church going through something, let them go through what they're going through because it is between them and the will of God. As believers, if we stand firmly on the word of God and trust in him, he will soar, to, he will help us to soar to higher eyes in our time of destitution, in our time of rejection, in our time of whatever trial and tribulation we may be experiencing. You see, one of the individuals that went through their molting season within the Bible was Job. Job lost his children. He lost all his possession. He lost all his wealth. He lost all his cattle. He lost everything. Job even lost, lost his health. The Bible tells us that Job was sick till his flesh fell from his bone. He had sores from the crown of his head. He had sores all over his body. And I can tell you now, I can imagine the stench that may have been coming from Job. I can imagine how Job must have smelled really terrible because I have experienced some, 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 some leg ulcers. I've experienced some wound. And when the smell hits you, I'm like, jeez, the smell is terrible. So for Job to be having sores from the crown of his head all the way to the, to the, to the bottom of his feet, he must be in, an, in a, an offensive smell. He must be really, really smelly. He lost everything. But despite all of that, Job said, I'm going to stay on this mountain. I'm going to stay in my molting season. And although people are going to talk about you, although people are going to talk about you have fallen from grace and you have sinned against God, and that's why you're going through what you're going through, but Job endured, endured his molting season. Job said, I'm going to trust God until I die. Job says, I'm going to trust the process. I'm not giving up. And because and because Job was so faithful to God, Job didn't curse God. When Job's wife told him to curse God and die, Job said, lady, stop talking nonsense. Don't come to me with that rubbish. I will never curse my God because I'm going through my molting season. I'm going through my painful experience. I'm going through the time. Let me go through whatever I'm going through. I'm going through my drought. I'm going through my, the loss of my finances, my health, my children are dead. Let me go through my molting process. And whatever the will of God is, he will restore me when he is good and ready. And we need to use Job sometimes as an example that though we are going through, though people are chastising us, though people are rejecting us, let us go through our molting season and let us trust God. Because Job trust God. Job endured his molting season. Job were, <laughs> he trust God. And because Job trusted God, he was, he was, he was, he was restored. He soared to higher heights. God blessed him with twice as much as he had before. Because Job stayed there and he prayed continuously.
me. You know, somebody, you would see Job and would probably say, this is a dead man, you know. This is a dead man. He's just going to die soon. But God restored back Job's health. He restored back his health. God even gave Job back more children than he had before. And God gave him more animals, more everything. He was restored. He had double for his trouble. And I'm encouraging you all today, don't give up. Enjoy your mounting process. Enjoy your trials. Enjoy your rejection. Because God is going to give you double anointing. He's going to give you double for your trouble. He's going to let you, he's going to let you soar through higher heights. He's going to let you soar. You see, when the eagle go through the molting process, they soar to higher heights than they could before. They soar higher, higher, higher. They, they, they soar so high is as if they're touching the sky. So as you go through your molting process, people will see that you are not blessed. And the same people that was cursing you with their tongue, with, with their mouth, the same persons that was looking down at you, the same people that was saying you're a nobody, the same people that was saying you have sinned against God, is going to stand there or sit there or they themselves going to die from wondering why is it? How did that happen? What happened there? Whoa, oh, they're going to start to wonder and ponder. Why? How is it that you're enduring? How is it that you got back double? How is it that you got back so much blessings and you're still at the same position that they were that they were in when you started your molting season? They're still in the same position. They're still way, they're even probably in worse position because what? They need the instead of they concentrate on developing themselves, instead of they concentrate on helping a brother or a sister through their molting season, instead of they intercede and pray for the brother and the sister and they use their tongue to talk and talk, talk, talk like a parent, they stay there in the same position that they are and they will remain there until they change their mindset and start to have the mindset like an eagle until they start to have an attitude like a lion oh we're not talking about the lion today but they need to some some of us need to ensure we do have the attitude of a lion i'll tell you about the lion another day but we need to have the mentality of an eagle that we can able to be blessed with double portion that we aim at soar high when God takes us out. Another person that I recognize that went through the molting season in the Bible was Hannah. Hannah also went through her molting season. And remember, as I said earlier, everybody will get a different revelatory experience from reading the Bible. It doesn't mean that what I say is wrong or what another person said is wrong. It is how a person received the revelatory experience. So my revelatory experience may be different from your revelatory experience. But as long as you know that it is what God says and it is within the body of, of what God is trying to, 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 to get the point to be put across. Hannah also went through her multi season. Hannah was married to a man by the name of Elkanah. And they tried for years to have a child, but God had closed her womb. God closed Hannah's womb. She was married, but she couldn't bear children. And although El um, Elkanah loved, loved Hannah, he was so desperately in need of a child. So he married a woman because he knew the, need, the, the, the men, he wanted a child so bad. And, and, and in those days, the men wanted a seed. They wanted, um, and they loved sons because the son will carry, carry, carry on with their name. And so he really wanted, he really wanted a, a child. But because God had closed up Hannah's wood, what, what Elkanah did was he went and he married a woman by the name of Penina. And she was able to bear children. So he went and he got a second wife by the name of Peniah, and she was able to bear children. So Elkaniah now got the children he so desired. So although Peniah was able to bear children, 
and Hannah wasn't. What Penaya did to Hannah was that she kept taunting Hannah. She kept provoking Hannah. And she kept, she kept gossiping about Hannah. She kept talking about Hannah being, I can imagine her telling all the other villagers that Hannah is a barren woman and, and, and Elkanah don't want her and Elkanah is going to dispose of her. But she, I mean, she don't know why Elkanah is still, still holding on to her. I can imagine how Penaya destroyed poor Hannah. She taunted her to her face and I probably imagine she taunted her to her back. She provoked her years upon years upon years because she wasn't able to have children. But each year, as she continued to irritate her, as she continued to frustrate her, and as she continued to mock and curse her. But what is so um, admira admirable about Hannah is she remained humble. She remained diligent. Hannah never cursed back Penaya. Hannah never cursed God. Hannah remained humble before God. She continued to pray and she continued to trust the process. She continued to go through her molting process. Hannah stayed in her molting season. Hannah stayed in her wilderness. Hannah stayed on the mountain. Top. She continued to remain faithful to God. She continued to wait on God. And even when Hannah couldn't eat, there were days when Hannah couldn't eat. And she cried profusely because she was hurting so much. And she was weeping and weeping and weeping. And I can imagine the tears that flow. She cried so much she didn't even eat. Did I not tell you earlier? that the eagle didn't eat for five months. Hannah wasn't eating. Hannah wasn't eating at all. She was so depressed. She was going through a depression. Sometimes as Christians, we think that if a person going through a depression, you know, it's the worst thing of the worst of the worst. But sometimes people have to go through certain things. And when you experience certain things in life, you are able to pull persons out because your experience makes you stronger. Your experience is not meant to break you. Your experience is there to take you to higher levels. Your experience is there to help you to soar to higher heights. So enjoy your season. Ask God, instead of looking at the circumstances that you're going through, ask God, what is the lesson to be learned from me going through this molting season in my life? Ask God, what is, what is the desired outcome? And as Hannah continued to pray, and as she continued to take the, take the, 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 provoke, the provoking from Penaya, she never lose the vision of her continuous prayer because she know that one day God will make a way for her. She know that one day God will bless her. And she continued and she prayed and she, and she prayed and she travailed so much. She travailed and she prayed without seasoning. She prayed nonstop. You see, some of us need to go through our period of travailing. We need to travail for what we want. We need to travail for the host, the car, the land, the husband, the wife. We need to travail for what it is that we need. Sometimes some people will pray today and they will get it tomorrow. Whereas some of us, like myself, we have to pray for years and months and years and months and before God would answer. And in that time, we need to stay steadfast. We need to stay secure. We need to ensure that we don't lose sight of the vision. We don't lose sight of where we're going. We don't get sidestepped or sidetracked by the, the by the parrots around us. We don't get we don't get disheartened by all the parrots that are around us. But we need to know that we have our own spirit of discernment, that we know who we can talk to about what we're going through and it's sometimes it's not everything God wants you to talk to people about some things you have to travail on your own but it's sometimes God will drop it in somebody else's spirit and they may pick up the phone and call me and say this coming to my spirit but you know you never tell that person so when that person pick up the phone you know 
God, that's your connection. And remember, I talked to you about connection. So God will send your connection because sometimes God knows that you can't do it on your own. Sometimes God knows that you need an intercessor to intercede with you. And he will send the intercessor to intercede with you, to travail with you, to help you pray you through the storm. And as Hannah continued to pray, after years after years, being in a multi-season, God blessed Hannah with three sons and two daughters. After molting for years and years and never cursing God, never giving up on the fight, never losing the vision, Hannah was blessed with three sons and two daughters. And one of Hannah's sons was called Samuel. One of Hannah's son was called Samuel. And the Bible tells us that Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. And just as much as how God loved David, God also loved Samuel. And Samuel grew up to be one of the major prophets. Some of you are going to give birth to some prophets and prophetess. Some of you are going to give birth to some ministers, some evangelists, some doctors, some lawyers, some evangelists, ministers, apostles, bishops. So go through your molting season and give birth to whatever it is that God has in store for you. Samuel grew up to be one of the major prophets. The Bible tells us he was a great prophet. He was upright. He was just. He was righteous. And he was fear. And you see, that's why we need to ensure that we don't put our mouth on people's children because you never know how your children will turn out to be. Because uh, Panaya children was a mention. Probably Panaya's children died. Probably Panaya's children turned out to be nobody. And Hannah's children that she travelled to turned out to be a major, major prophet who God loved because he grew up in the presence of God. God was always around Samuel. God was always with Samuel. God loved Samuel just as how he loved David. God treated Samuel with so much blessings that Samuel was 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 one was, was, was a great great leader. Now, as Samuel was working as a prophet. Watch, watch how God works. One of Samuel's main job as a prophet was to mediate between the Lord and the people of Israel. So if there was any Peniah in Israel, he would mediate with God to deal with them because Samuel was a major prophet, but his role was a mediator between the Israelites and, 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 and God. So he would go to the Israelites and tell them God said this, and he will go back to talk to God. And that was his main role. He was a mediator. So if there was any Pimaya in the in, in with amongst the Israelites, I'm sure Samuel would have told God to deal with all the Pimayas in there because of what Pimaya did to his mother. Isaiah 61, verse 78 tells us: for your shame, he shall have double, and for your confusion, they shall be rejoice in their portion. Let me read that again. Isaiah 61, 78, tell us. For your shame, he shall have double. And for your confusion, he shall rejoice. they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess the double everlasting joy. Shall be Everlasting joy shall be unto them, for I am the Lord. For I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering, and I will direct their work in truth. God says, I, the Lord, love judgment. And the Bible tells us, judge not, lest ye be judged. So while some persons will sit there judging the church brothers and the church sister, here God tells you in Isaiah 61, I love judgment. I love judgment. So as you're judging your brothers and sisters, the Lord is judging you. 
as you're making assumptions about your brothers and sisters, the Lord is judging you. As you're talking about your brothers and sisters, the Lord is judging you. As you're biting and, 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 and murmuring and tearing down the body of Christ, the Lord is judging you. So I'm appealing to anyone who, 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 who is doing this, who is talking about the people within Christ, who is tearing down the pastors, who is tearing down the reverence, who is tearing down the ministers, who is tearing down the church, the church congregants. I'm appealing to you to better change because God says, I love to judge. I, the Lord, love judgment. And the Lord Jesus will judge you according to what you're doing to his people. Because the Bible tells us, touch not the Lord's anointing. It's not only physical touch, but don't touch them with your mouth. Don't touch nobody with your, with, 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 with your words. You know, we grew up... And say sticks and stones will break our bones, but words will never hurt us. Words will hurt because when your bones are healed, the words will stay resonated within a person. And they will think about it for years upon years upon years. And they will not forget the words. So when you have your children and you talk bad about your children and you tell your children you're not going to be nobody, those words stick in your children's head. You need to be talking positivity over your children's life. You need to be talking positivity in your life. You need to say whatever it is that you want to achieve. Keep talking positiveness within your life and the life of your children. So for those that want to go on and talk about the church people who want to talk, you know, I'm, 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 I'm aware that there's, there may be pastors or there may be um, persons within the body of Christ that may be fornicating, that may not be living the life that is, a, that, is, that is pleasing to God. It's not your business. It has nothing to do with you. Let them fight out that judgment with God. Leave persons who you think or may know that is doing things that is not within the body is accepted within the biblical principles set by God. It's not your business. See person's business and leave it alone. God will judge them when he sees it fit and ready. But if God drops it in your spirit to intercede for the person, to pray for the person, pray for them. Help God to change them. You see, I, I had my problem. And my problem was, I too used to be a fornicator. I too used to, 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 to fornicate. But I had an intercessor who helped to pray me through that I, that I can say no more sin, no more shame, no more destruction. I'm able to say that I'm living a life that is pleasing for God. And so when God is ready to bless me, he will bless me. When God is ready to catapult me above the sun, he will catapult me above the sun. So for those who want to go around and talk about people, God will judge you. And when you see you're going through the problem, know that it's because you put your mouth on God's people. Hannah went through her problem. Job went through her problem. But God wasn't letting them endure those suffering because they were sinning. God knew that they had to go through the molten process. God knew that the Bible is something that we would use now to help elevate us, to help motivate us, to help us to walk and say, oh, Job had a bad experience, Naomi had a bad experience, Hannah had a bad experience, but, and I too is having a bad experience, but I'm going to go through my mountain process. I'm going to go through that season where I'm going to stay on top of the mountain, and I'm going to stay in my fasting. I'm going to stay in my prayer closet. I'm going to trust my God, and I'm going to do what God says to do. I'm going to intercede for who God tells me to intercede for. I'm going to see my brother and sister, and if I want to pray them out, and if the Holy Spirit leads me to pray them through, I'm going to pray them through. Stop Tearing down the body of Christ. Stop being, stop being, being keeping you. You got choir people on the choir, and 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 that one not talking to that one, and this one not talking to this one, and you got this brother sleeping with this brother. It's not my business, but at the same time.
man God is going to judge you. And you cannot be in the body of Christ in the mess and the filth because God does not like nastiness. God don't like mock. He doesn't want to want to in mock. He doesn't want to want to in, 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 in filth. Don't be like a pig in a swine. Don't be like a, a, a pig in the pen, in, in the mud and the muck, dirty up and messing up yourself and think you're going to come in the body of Christ and continue to be on top of Russia, preaching before people. God going to judge you. So those who want to do the, 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 the lifestyle of fornicating and sleeping with the church brother and the church sister, God will be with you. It's not for me to be with you. It's for God to be with you. And if I see my brother and sister going through certain circumstances, it doesn't mean that they're, they're punished. It doesn't mean they're living a sinful life. Unless they come to you and say, otherwise, keep your mouth shut. Don't be like the parrot. Be very, very silent. Be very, very still. Stand still and let God deal with who he needs to deal with. Let God catapult who he needs to catapult. Let God help person through the storm. Hallelujah. Glory to God. God says, for your shame, he shall have double. May your shame be doubled in blessings. May the shame that you endured in, the, in your life be, be, be restored with double portion of enjoying of, of, of blessings. Some of us, we've gone through rejection by men, by women, by children. But God says he's going to give us double for our trouble. Hallelujah. And I'm just going to leave this with you in closing. The ego symbolizes mobility, strength, vision, resilience, courage, and leadership, all of which are qualities we need to possess as Christians. We need to be noble. We need to be humble. We need to have strength. You know, some of us, when we're fasting, we, 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 look, so, we look so pale. Like you can look on your face and it's like, what's wrong with you? Why you look like, like so pale, like you're knocking on death door? Oh, I'm fasting. I haven't eaten all morning. Because we don't have no vision. We don't try to be, we don't try to sense. We need to change our mindset. Come off food. Stop thinking about the food and fast and pray. And let God, and, and take that look off your face. We don't need to look like that. We need to. Be strengthened. Stay in the strength. When God is when God is ministering to us, that we stay focused so that we can hear the voice of God. We can know when God is talking to us. We can know when God is ministering to us. We need to ensure that we remain resilient. We need to stay far from persons who are not walking in the way of God. Because people will tell you things and will lead you down the wrong path. People will tell you things and make you lose track of where you're going. So ensure that we, we stay resilient, we stay focused, we maintain our strength, we be noble. The last part of that scripture, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It tells us in Psalms 23, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You shall run and not be weary. You shall walk and not faint. You shall go through your storm and not be weary. You shall go through your trials and not faint. You shall, you, shall, you shall endure the heartache, the pain, the suffering, but you shall not faint, you shall not be weary because goodness and mercy is following you. When God has his hands on you, remember, remember, in order for the devil to touch Job, even the devil knows that he can't touch you unless God tells him to touch you. The devil can't do nothing to you unless God tells him to do something to you. Remember when the, when the devil went to God, when God said, have you considered my servant Job? And the devil turned around and said to him, but you have put an edge of fire of protection round about him. So the devil know that there's an edge 
edge of protection around about you. So if there's an edge of protection around about you, the devil can't touch you. And in order for the devil to touch you, God has to give him permission to touch you. So when you go through the trial, when you go through the tribulation, it means that God gave the devil the permission to let you go through them trials. It means you're going through that tribulation because God is expecting us to stay in that process and persevere and push our way through that process to, 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 to not give up, to not get disheartened, but to stay and follow the process and let him lead and guide and never, 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 ever give up. You know, we become a society nowadays where sin is so, so, so prevalent, so dominant. All of a sudden nowadays you see, you see um, everybody talking about um, the phobia man and the rich car and growing up you never used to hear about all of these things. And all of a sudden now everybody coming and and that's the reason i don't follow social media because when you go on there it's just too many perplexity and this one talking about this one over in this one and i'm like people become so brazen so blase with the sins that they're committing and i'm saying to us now if god said suffer not a wish to live but to die in jesus name and if god says he's giving us boldness and courage why do you think that anything can be set up if you're walking right with god if you're trusting in god if you're following the biblical principles why do you think the devil had to approach god when daniel was thrown into the lion's den god was there with him in the lion's den when the three hebrew boys were thrown in the fiery furnace and the soldiers that threw the three Hebrew boys into the fiery furnace. They that were putting the Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace were burnt up. And when they looked, when they turned it off and they looked into the fiery furnace, they, the king said, did we not put three men in the fiery furnace? Why am I seeing four men? It tells us that when you continue to not be fearful, when we continue to stand still and walk with God, that God will not let anything come our way that he knows that we cannot handle. That's why the Bible says he doesn't give us more than we can bear. He didn't teach us to swim to let us drown. He didn't build a home in us to move away. He didn't pick us up to put us down. And if God is making these promises to us, why are we becoming fearful Christians? Why are we becoming Christians that are so weak hearted and, and, and not trusting in God? Why are we becoming Christians that is not teaching the, the, the word of God to minister to other people. Everybody wants to come into church and pick up the mic, but there's people out there, out there in the world on the street that we can be ministering to, that we can be bringing into the body of Christ. So I'm encouraging us all today, don't give up, enjoy your molting season, enjoy your season of trials, enjoy them because it is what's going to catapult you to your double portion anointing. It's what's going to make you succeed in your Christian walk, in your, in your physical walk. It's going to increase you spiritually. It's going to increase you, it increase you in your children's life. Because when God bless you, he's not only blessing you, but he's also blessing your household. So I'm asking you all today, don't give up. Don't talk about people. But intercede and help people through the situations that they're going through. Stop tearing down people in the body of Christ. Stop tearing down persons when you see that that, that 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 might not look a certain way. Because you can't act like you a certain way. You need to remember you can't act like you. you can't talk like you want. You can't act like you want and expect to go to heaven. You have to act as according to the biblical principle of God. So I'm encouraging you all to enjoy the molting season like the eagle enjoys the five months of molting and then they get their vision restored and they are able to soar higher than ever before. So may you all follow the principles and soar to higher, higher heights. I open the floor to anyone who would like to share or testify in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, no one would like to testify, no one would like to share.
That's why we're all shy persons here today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm just going to pray. Hallelujah. Thanks. Thanks. We give you thanks for all you have done. We are so blessed. Yes. Our soul is at rest, oh Lord, we give you thanks, oh Lord, thanks, thanks, we give you thanks for all you have done, we are so blessed, yes. Our soul is at rest, oh Lord, we give you thanks, hallelujah, hallelujah Jesus, glory to your name Jesus, we're going to put our children before God tonight, we're going to put our children before the Father, so those who can unmute, unmute as we pray for our children. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have made, that we can rejoice and be exceedingly glad in it. Father God, as we put our children before you tonight, oh God, we pray, oh God, that you will just bless them in their day-to-day -day lives. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will just guide our children and protect them from every danger, every toil, and every smear. Father God Almighty, I pray that no weapon formed or fashioned against our children shall prosper. And any tongue, Lord God Almighty, that rises up against our children, may they catch a fire right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Let God arise and all the enemies be scattered from our children. Father God Almighty, you said the children shall lead the way. The children are the future generations. So, Father God Almighty, I pray that you will just touch them from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet. Father, our children shall be victorious in everything that they do. Father, they shall not succumb to peer pressure. They shall not succumb to illicit drugs. They shall not succumb to untimely deaths. Oh God Almighty, but Lord. Put the the, 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 um, the fire over them, oh God. Put your fire upon them, oh God Almighty. Oh God Almighty, put on the breastplate of righteousness upon them. Gird the lions, oh God Almighty. Father God Almighty, I pray that when they go to school, that any teacher that tries to frustrate or, frustrate or fatigue them, that Father God Almighty, you will deal with those teachers, oh God. Any teachers that look upon our children and try to suppress them, that Father God, we hand those teachers over to you. Oh God, any bully, any peer pressure, oh God Almighty, we pray and we cancel every bullying from their lives and we cancel every peer pressure from their life, oh God. Help them to make the right decision, oh God. Help them to know wrong from right and stick to the right, oh God. Father God, our children shall not be a statistics. They shall not be behind no bars. They shall not be six foot under. They shall not be in no gang affiliated activities. But Lord God Almighty, I pray that you cover our children continuously. I pray, oh God, and ask that you, re you release our children's angels and an assignment to cover them when they sleep, when they go out on the road. Bless our children, oh God Almighty, and we thank you for their lives, oh God, and as they continue to grow grow up to be lawyers, doctors, um, teachers, nurses, whatever profession they choose, oh God. I pray, Lord God Almighty, that they will be the leaders and not followers, oh God, of this world. But Father God Almighty, you put ministry into our children's lives. And we tell you thanks for their life. And as you continue to keep them in good health, we thank you a hundred times over, Lord God Almighty. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Just going to put all the pastors, the deacons, the ministers before God right now, all the officers within the body of Christ. Before God, we're going to pour our remains so and all all the ministers before God right now. Hallelujah. Father God, we put Reverend Sophie, all the bishops, all the evangelists, all the ministers, all the deacons, 
all the apostles. Father God Almighty, all the thanks of God, we put them before you right now, Jesus. Father God Almighty, I pray, oh God, that as they continue to do your work, that Father God Almighty will make a way for them, that Father God Almighty will strengthen their hearts. Father, when they feel our hope is gone, that you in their life will make a difference, that Father God, you will open up the front gates of heaven and pour out your blessings upon them, oh God Almighty. I pray that you'll touch each and every one of them from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet. I pray that every arrow that the enemy has sent for to take them out, that Father God, you will not fight with your fire, Father God, any witch of spirit that tries to come up against the people that you over, over your feet, oh God, that Father God Almighty will just blot it out, that Father God Almighty will take it back to the prison that you can they shall not die nor untimely things. They shall not die before their time. But you will help them to live a long life and stability. And you will give them good health. And Father, as they go through the mortal season, they will continue to trust you. And they will continue to believe in you. And they will continue to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, God, for those that have that have desires to go further to smoke God. And Father, God, I'm mindful of whatever it is. And they have played a bond We're just going to pray for the marriages tonight, for those that are married and for those that are expecting a partner or awaiting to get married. So we're going to put all the marriages before God right now in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we thank you, oh God. We thank you, Lord, for the marriages that are up on this platform. We thank you for the marriage that are on the Facebook, on the YouTube. We thank you for all the marriages that you have ordained and put together. And Father, as your word said, what you have joined together, let no man put us thunder. And Father God, we put all the marriages before you and we ask, oh God Almighty, that you will be in the midst of it, oh God. I pray, Lord God Almighty, that the word says a family that prays together, stays together. And I pray, Lord God Almighty, for those who marry persons that are unequally yoked, that Father God Almighty will forgive them. And Father God Almighty, that you will just make a way for them. And I pray, oh God Almighty, that any one that's buried and one is in church and one is not, that Father God, you will arrest the one that is not and you will put them into church. I pray, Lord God Almighty, that you will sustain them that is in the church, that they will not give up, that they will go through the mortal season. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will just bless them, that Father God Almighty, that they will stay under your blood, that Father God, the blood of God Almighty will cover them. Lord God Almighty, I pray that any Jezebel spirit, any Delilah spirit that try to come up against any marriages, I bind up that spirit right now. In 
in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I lose anything, oh God Almighty, that is trying to cause havoc in any marriages right now, oh God Almighty. I pray right now, Lord God, that your grace and your mercy will be upon the marriages, oh God. I pray, oh God, that for those that want children in their marriage, that you will open up their womb, womb, oh God Almighty. And I pray, Lord God Almighty, that you will just touch them with the fresh anointing of blessings and that they will give birth to a child. And Father, that they will continue to walk upright with you. Father, God Almighty, I pray, oh God Almighty, that no tongue that rises against any marriages that it shall come to pass. But Father, any tongue that rises against any marriage, May it touch a fire. May it be sent to the precipice of hell. Right now in the name of Jesus. For those that are going through trials in their marriage. That Father God, you will be in the midst. Because you said in your word, you will never leave them nor forsake them. You said, oh God Almighty, you, oh God, will create a new thing in their life, oh God. So Father God, I pray that you will create a new thing in their marriage. I pray that they will continue to love each other from day to day, from strength to strength. You will give them strength. I pray that they will have wisdom some knowledge and understanding to discern anything that is not in accordance with the will that was set out for their marriage. I pray, Lord God Almighty, that any man that tries to cause any harm to the wife of God, whether verbally, mentally, physically, spiritually, or emotionally, Lord God. I pray that I rest that man right now in the spirit. I pray right now, Lord God, and I send for the angels to arrest any man right now. And I pray that you will just do a 360 degree turn in that marriage life right now, oh God Almighty. I pray, Father God, that you will do a 360 degree turn. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you move upon that marriage right now and arrest the man in the spirit. I pray, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that you will arrest the host. In the name of Jesus Christ, arrest him in the spirit, oh God. Arrest him in the spirit, oh God Almighty. I pray, oh God, that no tongue shall tear down the God. Daughters in Zion, no talk shall tear them down right now. And oh God Almighty, no spirit of depression shall come upon them. But Lord God Almighty, I pray, oh God Almighty, that they will rise up. Oh God, and they will follow God and try to tear down any man. With Say good night to Facebook. Night night Facebook. See you all next week. 